First, let's pray one more time. And when we pray, I want to specifically pray against a spirit of fear. You know, there's two kinds of fear that the Bible talks about. There's a fear that cripples you in your life, and then there's a healthy fear. That's called the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord brings transformation. It's like, ooh, I'm going to have to actually one day stand face to face before the Lord. I better live right. Amen? That's the fear of the Lord. So we want the fear of God. What we don't want is the fear that cripples because, oh my gosh, stuff's coming on this, on this world unless it drives you to come and give your life and bring your life fully and completely surrendered to Jesus. So let's pray. Father, we bless you, we love you, we thank you for the good word of the Lord. Father, I pray that you'd speak through me to each of these, your people. I pray, Father, you would give them ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to understand what your Holy Spirit is saying to the church around the world in these last days. You're speaking to us by your word and speaking to us by your spirit. Those that have ears to hear will hear. Not everyone's listening, not everyone's hearing, but we desire to hear. And not just to hear, Father, but that it produce transformation in our life, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen and amen. Now listen, I can give you information this morning, but if you leave here this morning and all you gain is information, you've missed the main point of what Jesus is trying to warn this generation about, as I'm going to share with you. Amen? But if you leave here this morning saying, you know what? I need to really get serious about some things in my family, in my children, in my life, and really get serious about the things of Jesus Christ, then I think you're hearing the voice of His Spirit. Amen? So let's get started here this morning. I've got a lot of ground to cover and a lot of graphics. Now, I encourage you, if you're taking notes, I'll be honest with you, the best way today to take notes is not going to be with pen and paper. I'm probably going to go too fast. The best way is going to be with the old phone, taking a photograph of what you see in some of the graphics. That's what I've done before. Okay, When I've gone to a conference where there was a lot of graphics, and I couldn't keep up with pen and paper. I just went ahead and took the main things that I wanted to remember and clicked them for future use. So just an idea. Now, to get started, before I get started, I need to give you an introduction this morning. Then we'll get into the message that I call convergence. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1 through verse 6, the scripture says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need that I should write to you. This is Paul, inspired of the Holy Spirit, writing to the church of Corinth. He says, For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. How many of you have heard that before? Now, this is what frustrates me. Oftentimes, we ministers, we stop right there at verse 2. And we say, you know what? The day of the Lord's come as a thief in the night. Nobody can possibly know when it's going to be. People have been thinking for 2,000 years the Lord's going to come back and nothing's happened, blah, 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 blah. But then if you go on and you continue to read, he's coming as a thief in the night, but verse 3 says, For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. How many of you ladies here have ever given birth? How many of you ladies remember the birth pains? Something you never forget, huh? How many of you remember it? the birth pains get worse and worse and worse till the baby comes? Amen? The same thing, okay? These signs that we're going to talk about, these things we're going to discuss, will continue to get worse until finally the return of the Lord. Now look at verse 4, and this is what I want to talk about here. Jeremy, click me, please. I'm stuck. Listen, just don't, uh, Tiffany, don't go between the uh, camera and the slides like Jude just normally does. Let's just leave it on the camera or it's going to get stuck and I won't be able to click it. So, Jeremy, 
<clears throat> there you go, perfect. It says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. So the day of the Lord's coming as a thief in the night, but here in verse 4 it goes on and says, but you, brothers, are not in what? Darkness. Everybody say not in darkness. Not in darkness. That this day should overtake you as a thief. What does that mean? That means that the day of the Lord should not come upon believers as suddenly unexpected as if we didn't know it was going to take place. What it means is we need to be ready, we need to be alert, and we should know the approximate season of when it's going to take place. It says, you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch. Everyone say watch. watch. And be sober. Now, it was funny because when I put the advertisement on Facebook, I had somebody right on there say, where in the Bible does it say that you can figure out the day that Jesus is coming back? And it's funny because in my advertisement, I never said that I knew the day Jesus was coming back. <laughs> all I said, you can. All I said is we're going to know the season. Everybody say season. season. Listen, if it snows outside, you may not know the exact month, but you can pretty well ascertain it's winter time. Am I right? If you walk into somebody's house and you see the floor covered with pet hair, you may not see a cat, but you can pretty well ascertain they have one. Amen. If you hear barking in your neighborhood, you may not see the dog, but you can pretty well ascertain that there is a dog present. Amen. When you and I see the things we're going to discuss this morning, some of them for the first time in the history of the world, they're fixing and transpire then you and I had better look up and say, wow, this is definitely the season. Can someone say amen? amen? All right, let's get started. This is the message, Convergence. The Holy Spirit of God dropped this message into me about two and a half weeks ago. I was teaching on a series, and I had some other things I was going to teach on that I felt like I was needing to share with the congregation. And in my prayer time, the Holy Spirit put that word convergence. And I began to pray about it, and the Holy Spirit said, all these things that you're fixing to hear about, all are converging at this time, at this place, at this point in history for a reason. How many of you know the Christmas story? The Christmas story about the wise men. How many of you remember that the wise men we're looking for the king of the Jews who was born in Bethlehem. How many of you know that it wasn't the whole planet looking for the birth of Jesus? It was a couple, a few wise men who had been following the constellations and the scrolls that they had that were left to them by Daniel, by the way. They were descendants of the people that he taught there in Babylon. And that's how they knew. Well, listen, we're... You know, we believers, it's funny because we get on people whenever a pastor is going to talk about these type of things I'm going to talk about. You know, I get criticized and ridiculed and all kinds of stuff. But listen, you can say what you will, but those wise men were the only ones there at the birth of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So you know what? As a Jewish believer in Jesus, I decided when I was 17 and committed my life to the Lord... That I wasn't going to follow the traditions of man. I was going to follow the spirit of the living God and the word of God. And his word is pretty clear. And I'm determined that God doesn't put things in his word if he does not intend us to know them. Why would he put them there? And why would he tell us and instruct us to read them? Now, granted, some of them, many of them are difficult to be understood with the natural mind. You have to understand the scriptures, all of the scriptures. And the Holy Spirit gives you wisdom. And I've been studying through the scriptures about end time prophecy for 35 years. And I'm here to tell you I do not have it all figured out. And I'm here to tell you that what I thought I used to know about some things has changed over the course of the decades. But I can tell you that there is a spirit that God wants in his church recognizing and looking for the soon return of Jesus. It will change your life as never before. 
I had somebody say the other day, they said, you know, if I knew Jesus was coming back next week, I'd quit my job and spread the word of God. Well, hey, why would you quit your job? God designs you to work. Amen? If a man doesn't work, he doesn't what? Doesn't eat. How many of you like to eat? (laughs) So you got to work. Now, you can be spreading the word of God and work too. Amen? Amen. So the thing is, we want to get so close to Jesus that if we knew he was coming back tomorrow, we'd continue to do the same things we're doing. I don't think we're there, but that's where we need to get to. We're not talking about standing up on a mountain like they did in the year 1917 with the Seventh-day Adventists singing Kumbaya, waiting for Jesus to show up. They all sold their houses, their cars, their insurance, standing on a mountain. When Jesus comes back, he doesn't want to find you standing on a mountain. He wants to find you occupying, taking the fight to the very gates of hell themselves. And sharing Jesus with lost souls. Someone say amen. Amen. All right. Convergence. Everything coming together for this season, this time. Genesis 1.14. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs. Everyone say for signs. And seasons. It says and for days and years. This is all the way in the beginning in Genesis 1.14. God says that he's putting lights in the firmament of the heavens, the stars, the sun, the moon, to be there for signs. This is all the way in Genesis. Now listen to me. Over here in Hebrew, that word signs is oth. Everyone say oth. oth. It means a signal, literally or figuratively, like a flag, a beacon, a monument, A omen, a prodigy, evidence, a mark, a miracle, a token. And the signs that we're going to discuss today are literally a beacon, a flashing strobe light trying to get the church's attention, saying, Bride, I'm coming back. You better be prepared. You better wake up. Because we're not in darkness that we're asleep or a slumber. You and I, if you're a believer in Jesus, need to be fully and completely spiritually awake, completely alert, completely in touch and in tune with what God is wanting to say and is wanting to do in these end times. Amen? The time, the time of, 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 of games and churchianity is over. Now, there's always going to be that, but that's not what God's called us to do. Amen? And that's not what God's called the body of Christ to do. And he's moving by a spirit across the church around the world, waking people up in the midst of it. And I tell folks there's a church within the church. Amen? Now, that word seasons is moed. Everybody say moed. Moed. Properly an appointment. That is a fixed time or season, specifically a festival. In other words, God said, I'm putting the sun, the moon, and the stars in the sky And I'm putting them there as a token, as a sign. And I'm also putting it there so that you'll have an appointed time for your celebrations and your festivals. And there are actually seven festivals of the Lord that are dress rehearsals for Jesus. But that's for another day and another time. So the first thing I want to talk about is the solar eclipse that's transversing across America tomorrow. Everybody say tomorrow. August 21st, 2017. This is the first solar eclipse to go across the entire United States in 99 years. Everybody say 99 years. Now, just so you know, I want to explain to you that it's starting there on the West Coast. It's traversing all the way down there towards South Carolina, where you see that's the end of it. And you say, well, what's the big deal? There are solar eclipses. This is a full solar eclipse that has not come across the United States in 99 years. And you say, well, what's the big deal? Listen, to the Jewish mindset, I'm telling you, to the Jewish mindset, the solar eclipse is never a good sign. Do you understand that? Now, when Jesus was crucified, there was not a solar eclipse. The Bible says that the sun grew dark for three hours. This solar eclipse is only going to last for minutes. Do you understand that? When Jesus was crucified, the sun went dark for hours. Why was that? 
Because, again, it was a sign to those people of that time that something incredible was taking place. Now you say, well, what's going to happen here in the United States? Listen, I'm not here to give you a prediction. I'm going to show you what has happened, and you have to make up your own mind. Will anything happen? Maybe nothing will happen. We'll see. But all I know is in my family, kind of like what Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now, (coughs) this is the solar eclipse path. Now, the dark path is called the uh, path of totality. That's where the uh, moon completely and totally blocks out the sun. Here in Abilene, we're not in the pathway of totality. We are, I believe, in the 80 percent partial eclipse range. Listen, they have glasses at Lowe's. They're a dollar. It's a great teaching tool for your children, for yourself. I encourage you, if you get a chance, take a look. You won't get a chance to see it again until the year 2024. And we'll talk about that, but it's been 99 years. Now, let's continue. Earthquakes. You said that's all you're going to say about the eclipse? Nope. I'm going to talk about the convergence here shortly. That's just to whet your appetite. Earthquakes. How many of you have heard about all the rumblings at Yellowstone National Park? And I read an article in the paper yesterday. A NASA scientist has gone public because he has some real concerns because NASA has some plans to try to alleviate Yellowstone National Park by drilling a hole and putting some pressurized water in that hole. And he's thinking it may do more harm than good. Now, Yellowstone National Park is on top of what's known as a supervolcano. And the thing about that supervolcano is NASA, with their satellites, have discovered so much magma in the Earth that it could fill the Great Lakes twice over underneath that ground. Now, it's a beautiful park for those of you who have been there or traveled there. And I'm not telling you that Yellowstone's going to erupt. I'm telling you that the ring of fire is lit up right now. And there is more volcanic activity around the world now in the year 2017 than ever in recorded history. Just FYI. You can look it up for yourself. But listen to me. This right here is a map of the United States. And the red parts that you see are known as major quake zones. Okay? Major quake zones. Now, you know, of course, that area there in California along the San Andreas Fault. And we're going to talk about these other areas. But I want you to notice, I didn't draw this. This came off the United States uh, 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 Geographical Association that does all the earthquake maps. And so red, or that bright purpley red, is the highest hazard. Okay? Keep that in mind. Superstition. The definition of superstition, we're going to come back to earthquakes and we're going to come back to the eclipse in a moment. The definition of superstition is a belief or notion not based on reason or knowledge. Everybody say not based. I am not today talking to you about believers being superstitious. Because superstition is not based on reason or knowledge. I'm talking to you today about a warning that you're going to hear that I believe is straight from the word of God for this generation. And I believe that this warning is based on God's reasoning, the knowledge of God's word, not superstition. So don't confuse what we're talking about with superstition. Do you understand me? Then it goes on, another definition of superstition is irrational fear of what is unknown or mysterious, especially in connection with religion. Well, how many of you know as believers in Jesus, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound and disciplined mind. Someone say amen. Amen. So we don't have a rational fear. It's not based on superstition. We have reason and knowledge in the scripture. And the last one is any blindly accepted belief or notion. Well, again, I'm going to show you today from the word of God that what I'm talking about is not blindly accepted. It's plain, it's in the scripture, and God's word is infallible. Man can argue it, they can disagree with it, they can say, I don't want it to be true, it does not change it. 
They could say all that they wanted to say about Jesus. It did not change the fact that he is the son of the Most High God. That he is the word of God come in the flesh. And that from a Jewish man. The one and only true Messiah of all time who left and will come again. Amen? Amen. Matthew 16, 1 through 3. It said, Some Pharisees and Sadducees who came to Jesus, they wanted to trap him. So they asked him to perform a miracle for them to show that God approved of him. But Jesus answered, When the sun is setting, you say, We are going to have fine weather because the sky is red. In other words, he's saying, look, you can look outside and you can tell whether or not it's going to rain or whether or not it's going to be a beautiful day by looking at the sky. How many of you here in Abilene can look out over the sky sometimes and you see those large, growing, cumulus clouds with the lightning coming across in it and the sun setting behind it and it's headed right here, and there's probably a good chance you're going to get rain. Isn't that right? So that's what Jesus is saying. He says, and early in the morning, you say it's going to rain because the sky is red and dark. You can predict the weather by looking at the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs concerning these times. Now, of course, Jesus is talking about the signs concerning his arrival, his being there. He fulfilled 239 specific Bible prophecies. Now listen to me. Jesus is like, hey guys, you can tell whether it's going to rain or not, but you can't determine, you can't interpret what season, what time you're in right here, right now. They were talking to the King of Glory and had no idea. Wouldn't it be a shame For the Lord to return and most of God's people to be caught unaware because they and preachers and ministers were too busy building their own kingdoms than they were trying to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit to prepare God's people for an eternal kingdom. Convergence. So let's go back to our solar eclipse. Let's go back to our earthquakes. So what you see here, and the laser doesn't work on the televisions, but what you see here is June 8th, 1918, the last solar eclipse 99 years ago. And it started roughly in Washington State and went down to Florida. And then you see the one that starts tomorrow going across the U.S. that starts over there in Oregon and ends out there in South Carolina. Now what happened 99 years ago? That was my question. 99 years ago, 675,000 Americans died to something that was known as the Spanish flu. How many of you here have never heard of the Spanish flu? You know what's amazing? They don't even teach this in school. It was the worst pandemic to happen in the world in modern times. We lost more United States soldiers. How many of you gentlemen or ladies served at one time in the U.S. military. God bless you for your service. But listen, we lost more United States military servicemen to the Spanish flu during World War I than we did to the actual war. And do you know how many people died around the world due to this pandemic? 50 million people. How could you not hear about that in schools? Look it up. 50 million people. They had hospital camps set up outside all across America trying to treat these flu victims. These are just some pictures of it. Gymnasiums, auditoriums, all of them were turned into hospitals. The Spanish flu started four months before the solar eclipse. Now, am I saying there's a pandemic coming? I don't know what's coming. Could be nothing. I'm just showing you what history has recorded, and then you make your own decisions. Now, remember the major earthquake map I showed you guys? You see this right here? This is the solar eclipse. This is totality. This is where it's going to be completely dark. Do you notice something funny that I noticed? 
It passes over every major earthquake zone in the United States. Every single major zone is passed over nearly precisely and exactly. Now I want to show you something else. The next earth, I'm sorry, the next full solar eclipse that will transverse the United States is in the year 2024, okay? This is 2017. That's how many years, math professor? Seven years, amen. Seven years, April 8th, 2024. Now, this is interesting. You see where the two cross? This could be just coincidence. Of course it could. I'm not saying anything's going to happen. I'm just showing you the facts of this convergence and show you how fascinating it is. That's the San Madrid Fault. That fault erupted in 1811. And that fault is not like the San Andreas Fault because when it shakes, it can be felt in six, seven, eight different states. And now the geologists have some real concerns, because I looked it up, about the San Madrid Fault. Now, I had a prophetic dream a couple of years ago. And my dreams that God has given me have always come to pass. I'm talking about the prophetic ones. And I saw in this prophetic dream a terrible earthquake east of this country and one west of this country that has not yet happened. <clears throat> Does that mean anything? I don't know. But what am I doing? I'm praying for a nation and I'm trying to share Jesus with people as much as possible. Amen? Not playing church games. This is the kingdom of God. This is eternity we're dealing with. Someone say amen. amen. So here you have it. Here you have the eclipse of tomorrow, and there you have the solar eclipse of 2024, and X marks the spot. There you see the San Madrid fault line at the convergence of all of those states there. Does it mean anything? It may not mean anything at all, but I did find it interesting. Now, <clears throat> I talked to you about the solar eclipse. I mentioned to you about the earthquakes. Talked to you a little bit about the convergence of those. Now I want to talk to you for a minute about prophecy. There was a Jewish rabbi in the 12th century, and he predicted some things that have come to pass. But before I read his prophecy, I want to read this scripture out of the Old Testament out of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. You may wonder how you can tell when a prophet's message does not come from the Lord. Everybody say, does not. Does not. If a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and what he says does not come true, and what he says does not come true, then it is not the Lord's message. Someone say amen. amen. That prophet has spoken on his own authority and you are not to fear him. So if this 12th century rabbi had spoken his prophecy and it didn't come to pass, then you know what? It wasn't God speaking through him. But if he spoke it and everything he said has already come to pass, then the Lord did speak through him. So I want to share this prophecy with you because it's fascinating. Judah ben Samuel. Everyone say Judah ben Samuel. Judah ben Samuel was a legendary and prolific German rabbi of the 12th century. He made some astonishing and specific predictions about the future of Jerusalem and Israel that came true. Judah ben Samuel, this is what he wrote. He says, when the Ottomans, the Turks, conquer Jerusalem, they will rule over Jerusalem for eight jubilees. Now, just so you know, a jubilee was 49 years and the 50th year was called the year of Jubilee, okay? So pretty simple, eight Jubilees. Now at this time when he wrote this, the Turks were not over Jerusalem. It did not happen while Judah ben Samuel was alive, but rather just over 300 years later, as I'm going to show you in a minute. The Mamluks, who had been reigning in Jerusalem since 1250, were conquered in 1517 by the Ottoman Turks. They remain for eight jubilees. I told you, according to the Bible, a jubilee is 49 years and the 50th year is the year of jubilee. So eight jubilees is simply eight times 50 jubilees, which is how many years? 400 years. That is to say they were in Jerusalem for 400 years. Remember, they conquered it in 1517. 
In 1917, exactly 400 years later, the Ottomans, the Turks are defeated at the Battle of Jerusalem during the First World War. The British Army's General Allenby enters Jerusalem on foot. Afterwards, Jerusalem will become no man's land for one jubilee. Exactly 400 years later in 1917, the Ottoman Turks were conquered by the British, just like Judah ben Samuel prophesied. The League of Nations conferred the mandate for the Holy Land and Jerusalem to the British. Thus, from 1917 under international law, Jerusalem was no man's land. Now look at this. Judah ben, uh, uh, Judah ben Samuel said this. He says, after those eight jubilees, they're conquered by the Turks. He says, afterwards, Jerusalem will become no man's land for how long? One jubilee. And that would be how many years? 50 years. Exactly. The League of Nations conferred that mandate for the Holy Land. And like I said, Jerusalem to the British. So from 1917, under international law, Jerusalem was literally considered no man's land. Even the wording was the same. And then in the ninth jubilee, Judah ben Samuel writes, this is his prophecy word for word, it will once again come back into the possession of the Jewish nation, which would signify the beginning of the what? Messianic end time. Now, when did Jerusalem... At the end of the ninth jubilee, again, come back into the possession of the Jewish nation. Then when Israel captured Jerusalem in the Six-Day War of 1967, exactly one jubilee, what's 1917 plus 50, 1967, Jerusalem reverted to Jewish-Israeli ownership once again. Thereby, according to the prophecies of Judah ben Samuel, the Messianic end times actually began in 1967. Isn't that fascinating? Now, <clears throat> let's look at the signs of the heavens. Now, this is where I'm going to take all this and we're just going to tie it up. And I'm telling you, you're going to have the fear of God before I get done. Are you learning something? Yes. How many of you think God has a plan? <clears throat> Listen, the scripture says that he is the Lord, he does nothing without speaking, first through his prophets to his people. God wants his people to know why. So we will be alert, we will be awake. Amen. Amen. How many of you women remember when you were about to get married? How many of you knew what day and what hour you were getting married, at least? Amen. How many of you were looking forward to that? Everybody say, yes. You are looking forward to that, amen? Listen, Jesus is coming back for a holy nation, a royal priesthood of people from around the earth, regardless of what sheetrock they attend, amen? He's looking for a people who are awake, who are walking in the light, are in allowing the Spirit of God to transform their lives. Someone say amen. amen. Now this last part, this is going to blow you away. Some of you know this. But this is going to just floor you. Here we go. Once in 7,000 years, the 23rd of September, 2017. Now, I have a friend of mine, Jason McLean. Jason's going to be watching this, mentioning you, Jason. He is an author of about four books on this subject that I'm fixing to tell you about. And he's been studying it out for years. He could tell you the names of the constellations, the stars, uh, the Babylonians look at the constellations, but he is a believer in Jesus, loves God, and he is trying, just like Daniel, to ascertain the signs of the times that we live in. And here, on the 23rd of September, 2017, this graphic, there's going to be a constellation that he used a computer, and I talked to him yesterday by telephone, he used a computer and he said, Pastor, he said, I went back 20,000 years on the computer, literally 20,000 years. I went forward 20,000 years, and there's no other perfect alignment to Revelation 12 than what we see taking place on the 23rd of September, 2017, <clears throat> along with all the blood moons and everything else. So I want to read to you Revelations chapter 12, two verses, 
Now I go back to the constellation chart that you see here. In Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, and let me tell you this. Those of you who read through Revelations, you can't read it like a Greek person. You can't read it like a, a, a university professor. No offense, university professors. You have to read it. It's not in chronological order. Okay? God doesn't think like we do. He layers things. Okay? He thinks like an onion. We think like a list. A, B, C, D, E, F. You follow me? You ever see an onion? You peel the first layer, and you peel, man, you keep peeling and peeling and peeling that thing, and you're, at the little, you're still not done. You could peel that some more. That's the word of God. So Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 6, it says, Then a great wonder. Everyone say a great wonder. A great wonder. And I looked up that word wonder, and it literally is signs portending remarkable events soon to happen. The Greek word is simeon. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. But listen, great remarkable events soon to happen. A great wonder appeared in the sky. Everybody say the sky. Well, you know, listen, I'm going to be just plain spoken here. When the Lord says there's going to be a great wonder in the sky, guess where it's going to be? Chances are it's going to be where he says it's going to be. Amen. You know, it drives me crazy, these preachers who say, well, you know, you just read what you want to read into it. Listen, when he says there's going to be a great, marvelous sign in the sky, and if you take that literally, that means in the sky there's going to be a what? Great wonder. There's going to be something remarkable soon to happen. And it appeared in the sky. It says there was a woman whose dress was the sun, who had the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. And that, my beloved is the constellation that you see right here. As you see the sun over her shoulder, as you see the 12, exactly 12 stars, each representing the 12 tribes of Israel, by the way. And then it goes on where she gives birth. I mean, there's a star that comes out from between her legs. Exactly 41 weeks, the gestation period, from the time of the blood moons. I mean, it just goes on and on. It is incredible. And that scripture in Revelation 12 has its fulfillment September 23rd, 2017. Now, what I am not saying, everybody say he's not saying. I am not saying Jesus is coming back September 23rd, 2017. Does everybody understand it? I'm saying he could come back any time from the Feast of Trumpets this year all the way through 2033. I am telling you that the Lord's coming back sooner rather than later. I'm telling you, I am convinced from my heart of hearts that we are the last generation. Well, what if we're not, Pastor? Then you were on fire for God and lived for Jesus and lived a good life and you died. Because one way or another, you're stepping into eternity, either with your body or without your body. Now, I prefer my body. It's going to be changed. But if not... We're still stepping into eternity. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, I love this. Look at this. Verse 2. She was soon to give birth, told you. And the pains and suffering of childbirth made her cry out. Now, my friend could go into detail. I can't remember. I'll be honest with you. He tried giving me everything to remember. And there was like, I'm like, Jason. You, that's just not me, okay? I'm not going to remember every name of every star and which one she's giving birth to and okay, which one's coming out from, from, from between her legs. But then it says, another mysterious sight. Everyone say another mysterious sight. <laughs> Appeared where? In the sky. So where's this other one? In the sky. There was a huge red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and a crown on each of his heads. Now, we Bible prophecy teachers, we've always taken these and we said, well, you know, the 12 stars, the 12 tribes of Israel, and blah, 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 blah. But I'm telling you, yes, that's a layer, but I believe that there are also constellations and signs that God has put in the sky, like he said, to what? Why would God do that? Maybe to wake up those people who are looking for his appearing. Maybe to say, hey, even if there's a chance, maybe I need to get ready. Maybe I need to make sure that 
The dust is blown off of my Bible. The dust is blown off of my heart. Maybe it makes sure I'm not involved in worldly things and I'm allowing Jesus to transform and change my life. Someone say amen. amen. Now, this is... Oh, I missed this. Then a great wonder... No, the last part, verse 4. With his tail he dragged a third of the stars. Now, my friend Jason, he drew this last night. He stayed up late for me. And I'm not going to read it all for you because it's too much information to get into today. But I'll just tell you that he drew out the constellation that the Babylonians associated with the serpent out of the book of Genesis. Okay? And if you notice, it's a serpent with seven heads. Pretty fascinating. And that constellation is in the sky at the same time the other one is. Pretty fascinating. Out of the sky, drew these stars, threw them down to the earth. He stood in front of the woman in order to eat her child as soon as it was born. Then she gave birth to a son, that was Jesus, who will rule over all nations with an iron rod. Someone say amen. Amen. But the child was snatched away and taken to God and his throne. And that's where he is to this day, amen? Seated on the right hand of God the Father. Remember, these are layers. I'm not here telling you that this doesn't have another layer to it. It does, but I'm talking to you about the layer of the stars, the constellations, how the wise men could look at the sky and know that the king of the Jews was born. But they didn't have all the scrolls, so they didn't know exactly where. So they went to King Herod, not realizing what a wicked king he was. And Herod was jealous for his throne, and he went about seeking to destroy baby Jesus, remember? He put to death all the babies aged two years old and younger. Wicked man. Verse 6, Israel, the woman, fled to the desert to a place God had prepared for her, where she will be taken care of for 1,260 days. In case you don't know, that's three and a half years. It's the second half of the tribulation. Israel is going to flee their country, literally to the land of Moab, the Bible says, to, I believe, the city of Petra, where she is going to be in hiding until Jesus comes back to rescue her. But that's for another day as well. 1 John chapter 3, as we wrap it up, verse 2 and 3. Beloved, now we are children of God. This talk to the believers in Jesus. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he, Jesus, everybody say Jesus, when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. I can't tell you exactly what our new bodies are going to look like. I just know that as he is, we're going to be just like him. Amen. How many of you ever have uh, aches and pains in this current body? How many of you getting a little older? And if you're younger, don't worry, you'll be getting older. If the Lord doesn't return soon, amen? Amen. You'll be going that direction, guaranteed. And everyone who has this hope in him, what hope? That we're going to know that when he, when Jesus is revealed, we shall be like him. When he appears, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, Jesus, is pure. See, this is what it boils down to. If you think and believe that the Lord's coming back very soon, it's going to cause this purity to rise up in your heart where you're going to want to live right for God. Amen. If you knew that the end of your physical life were next week, how many of you think that your prayer life probably be a little bit different? Amen? Or oh me? Listen, if you think that Jesus could come back at any minute, listen, it was God's plan for the church to always look to think that Jesus was coming back at any moment. Jesus planned it that way. Why? To keep his church pure. To keep them alert. To keep them awake. But I'm telling you that Jesus really is coming back soon. That we finally reached that place where we're that generation. And you know what's sad? People won't even talk about it. Amen. Somebody say, well, you know, this preacher said this was going to happen. And you know, they misconstrue things and misunderstand things, but they've always done that with Scripture. 
And I'm here telling you that this is fixing to be an incredible season. I tell people all the time, the worst parts of the Bible are ahead of us. And God's people, we need to be looking up because I believe our redemption is drawing near. And I don't want to be caught asleep. Someone say amen. amen. I want you to look at this picture. That's Jesus reaching his hand down to you. First thing I want you to know, Jesus, you're not doing Jesus a favor by giving your life to him. He's doing you a favor amen. by saving you and delivering you. Amen? And I'm not going to sit and beg people and make it sound like, oh, please come to... It's like, hey, better than dying in your sin for eternity, Jesus offers you a way of escape if you'll accept it. He says to turn from your ways to repent from your ways and your wickedness and turn to him once and for all. And he'll be there for you. But if you continue in your ways, know that one day you'll have to stand and give an account, not to the Lamb, but to the King of Kings. And that's every one of us. Amen? Let's all stand to our feet. I'm not going to ask you today to bow your head or close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to open your eyes, lift your head. And I'm going to pray in just a moment and I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to touch some hearts you see I know in my heart that there are some people here who have been playing games with God or who really aren't sure that if they died they'd even go to heaven they've been living for themselves not living for Jesus they know it, God knows it and Jesus wants to change your life he wants to rescue you from yourself and from your sin and I'm going to pray in just a moment. And when I do, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to give you boldness to come forward and to recommit your life to Jesus. Or maybe you've never given your life to Jesus, but you want to. Or maybe you know you're far from God and you need to come back to him. Don't leave this place today having heard this message of warning, thinking, oh, just a bunch of baloney. Yeah, that's what they thought about the Messiah coming. And he came, and you know what? The large majority of them missed it. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word of God. I thank you that your word is quick and alive and powerful to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Father, reach down and touch every life, every heart. Speak to your people in a way that is clear, that they can clearly understand. Convict the heart that's living for themselves. Convict those, Lord, who've been doing things their own way and not your way, and they're saying, Lord Jesus, today I want to change that. I want to change that. If that's you, and you want to recommit your life to Jesus or commit your life to Jesus for the first time, you want to make things right with God, you take the first step right now and come forward and line up all along the front right now in Jesus' name. Come down, come down, come down. You know who you are. Just come forward in Jesus' name. I'm going to wait just a moment longer. Anyone else? Now's your time. I just sense there's one person. You're just wrestling with your own heart. Wrestling with your own heart. Don't wrestle. Hear the voice of his spirit. Allow him to change your life today. Those of you down front, matter of fact, everybody all together, I want you to loudly and boldly say with me, say, Father, Father in the name of Jesus, name of Jesus I, today I today speak out with my mouth, with my mouth that, Jesus that Jesus Christ is my Lord. Is my Lord. I, turn I turn from my ways, from my ways to your ways. Lord Jesus, forgive me for my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. From this day forward, I will learn of you, I will love you, and I will serve you. 
all the days of my life. Lord Jesus, fill me to overflowing with your Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord, to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Remain standing up here. Guys, if some of you ladies would just stand behind the ladies and men stand behind the men. And I just want to pray for them. Amen. I just want to pray for them individually. The rest of y'all may be seated for just a moment. Y'all stretch your hands towards these. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless you. I love you. I thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit in this sister's heart, Father. I pray that you would continue, Lord God, to show yourself real on her behalf. Strengthen her arms, Father. Give her a new heart, Father, a heart of understanding of your word and a hunger to know you as never before. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, for these men. Father, I pray, Lord God, that from this day forward, they truly surrender themselves to you, Lord. No more living for themselves, no more walking after the flesh, but, Lord, walking and following after you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray, Lord God, in Jesus' name, for my sister to know you, Father, intimately and personally, that you'll be a lamp to her feet and your word a light to her path, Father that she'll walk with you all the days of her life, that she'll not turn her foot to the left hand or to the right hand. But from this day forward, all things are become new in you, Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he has become a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. Father, I pray that you renew this sister's relationship with you, Lord God. Lord, oftentimes we get burdened down with the cares of this life and the cares of this world. Father, I pray for your Holy Spirit, Lord, to just breathe a fresh wind upon her life, Lord God, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet, Father. Breathe afresh upon her, Lord. Father, I pray over my dear sister, Jesus. She's come forward today and saying, Lord, I need to know you personally, Lord God, intimately, Lord. I need to walk with you as never before, Lord God. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that she's been born again into your kingdom, Lord. She's confessed you as Lord Jesus, and that you make her heart new, Father, from this day forward, Lord God. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for a recommitment of their lives to love you and serve you. Father, no more serving themselves, Lord, but living for you, Jesus, that they'll not turn their foot to the left or to the right, but all the days of their lives they'll follow after you in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. amen and amen. Let's give Jesus a hand clap for these. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Listen, hug a neck and you may be seated in the name of the Lord. God is good. Amen. You know, after I studied for this message, it put the fear of God fresh. Everybody say fresh. Fresh Fresh in my heart. And I said, you know what? Sometimes we just get to playing those religious games with God. And I'm like, Lord, man, we're on a a, a short timetable here. You know, we're running out of commercial space, commercial time. You know, that's the time you can go get your popcorn, get your drinks, go back and finish watching your show. It's how we've been treating the church. I'm telling you, we're running out of commercial time, guys. It's time to get real. So you say, what do we do, Pastor, from this day forward? Pretty simple, live for God. Love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's an every day, daily taking up your cross and following him. That's an every day saying, Jesus, your will be done, not mine. That's an every day putting your nose in the scripture and in the Bible and saying, Lord, speak to me through your word. That's an every day getting committed to a body of believers somewhere. If we're not the body of believers for you to commit to, we'd love to have you. But maybe you can't hang with a Jewish rabbi. Go find a body somewhere. But you need to find somewhere to plug yourself into. Because otherwise you'll be like these who wander from place to place to place, never growing, always trying to learn, and never really gaining a real true relationship with one another and with Jesus that will transform your life. Amen?